I think it's also like the warm reception is also like like that relief that you felt being on stage saying like I don't have to explain myself the audience feels the exact same relief yeah, yeah. there's in that fear of like oh is someone gonna make a joke that's gonna make me feel unsafe here mm -hmm. like exactly like, Exactly. I, I'm not going to get grabbed like behind the waist because it's a, a tight bar. You know what I mean? Just like the yeah. relief that everyone's in a space that's safe for them. It just yes. uh, like, yes. I feel it is. I love, I love comedy and performing, but for me, like that's, that's my favorite part of, of small fish. Yeah. And yeah. I just love the whole, like the inclusiveness of it, like the diversity of, of the, of the performers and the diversity of, of the audience because it's not very often that i'm in front of a diverse audience like hi everyone welcome back this is uh season five of willfully funny uh this week my guests are the creators of small fish maggie harder and glennis marshall welcome hey, <laughs> thanks, for having me. thanks come on thank you so much for uh for being here. Uh, what I usually do at the start um, is ask my guests to give uh, their their socials so that people can find them. Um, I'll also include them in the uh, in the show notes, but I, I've started asking at the beginning, you know, in case as somebody's listening, if they want to check you out and start following you, they can do that. So please nice. go ahead. <laughs> Well, our show Instagram is at small fish show and my personal Instagram is at Maggie May Harder. And my personal Instagram is glennis.marshall and it is spelled the same way uh, across all social media because it's really not hard to get handles with my name. Uh, you know, it's, it's ancient. That's good because usually like if it's a common name, you have to add like all these numbers at the end, yeah. you know? Wow. Well, welcome. Thank you for thank you for being here. And uh, so my first set of questions is I'd like to know, like each of your journeys into performance, into like comedy, and then how the two of you met, and how the whole small fish show came to be. So I, know, I know that's in stages and in <laughs> that's the journey baby that's we're the journey on, exactly the ride. Totally. so whoever wants to go first okay I can go first okay um so yeah I uh I, I've been on stages for I would I would say most of my life I grew up doing a lot of musical theater and um I I would audition for these very kind of literally like pretty princess roles and like these, you know, protagonistic roles. Um, and, uh, and I would always, always get the, the comic relief. Um, I would say the most overt example would be I auditioned for Fiona and uh, I got the role of donkey in Shrek the Musical. Um, and so this, this just kind of became apparent uh, that, it, you know, comedy was something that I was good at and, and timing and, and rhyming was something that I liked. Um, and so I, I took up stand up when I was about 16 years old. Um, I went to Humber College for their comedy program. I was in Toronto for four years uh, on the uh, stand up and sketch circuit, went, to, went through the second city and everything. Um, and then when the pandemic hit, I, I had to go home uh, because I, I couldn't afford to uh, keep my place in Toronto. I was, I was really unhappy and burnt out. And I kind of had a I had a second, as millions of us did, to kind of reset and and reflect, and that's when I decided I wanted to go more into um, musical comedy and and show production. And uh, Small Fish is the beautiful marriage of. Oh, it's not just that; it's so many more. It's a big polyamorous melange, <laughs> of huge marriage of all the things that I love to do um so uh so yeah I think uh I I think everything kind of led up to um to this because I get to pull from all those different backgrounds stand-up sketch musical theater ballet mm -hmm. yeah well, that's um, awesome ballet was way back <laughs> I used it I used it <laughs> so I I 
my parents are photographers and my mom does a lot of arts photography. And so I have been watching plays forever and ever and ever. Like my mom would bring me with her when she would shoot dress rehearsals. And it was like really special. It was just me and my mom in the whole theater watching these huge plays. And it was like so much fun. And then I did like drama summer camps, blah, 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 blah. And then um, high school improv um, was really like Gladys and I have bonded over the fact that mm -hmm. high school improv has fundamentally changed who we are as human mm -hmm. beings like trying improv at 15 was like holy shit like this is this is it for me like if I could do anything the rest of my life it would it would be this um and then I went to Carlton for public affairs and policy management and I always oh hi Wendell <laughs> Thanks, baby boy. <laughs> there might be a couple of those. Oh, there will be I'm many. sure there was like 50 feet where he could have walked, but no. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Like so, <laughs> much so, baby boy. Uh, do we want attention? Do we want attention? Okay, there we go. Um, <laughs> see, this is all we wanted. Um, so then I went to Carlton and like, I always loved comedy, but I never saw it as, I never saw comedy in theater as something I could pursue. Um, like I saw myself working for the government or like becoming a lawyer or something. Um, and then um, I started doing more theater admin work this year and that opened a lot of doors. And then me and my partner, Megan, we wrote a play for the Fresh Meat Festival this fall. And that changed our lives. Fresh Meat changed our lives entirely. Cause it was like, oh my God, I like really like creating. I really like script writing. I really like doing my own comedy. I also had like, started doing stand-up and I I felt like I had a really hard time getting my foot in the door because I'm like a hairy Jewish queer woman and that is not the Ottawa demographic that is not <laughs> the comedy scene here so it's like if I want to get anywhere with this I have to make my own places because I'm not like if I get on my hands and knees and beg in front of these like 40 something white men it's like not gonna like you know what I mean and so, I hear you. I know. I know. yeah, yeah. Oh my yeah. goodness. Yeah. So wow. that's. I hope that was coherent. But that's yes, it just <laughs> yeah, it I, seems I totally like left out the part where I I did improv for twelve years. <laughs> <laughs> but that's that's definitely like Maggie and I knew that we we worked really well together just through that immediately. Like we had the same language and we you know, we, we spoke the same way, just, I think, because of that, so. Yeah, totally. That's amazing, because yeah. it seems like, like, mid-teens, like, 15, 16, is a pivotal age for discovering, because the same, it's it, same, same thing happened with me. I discovered at 15 years old that I wanted to be a stand-up. It took me a little longer. I waited, like, three, almost four decades before I even attempted, because of fear and all kinds of other things but it was at oh, around that on. age where it was like that's what I want to do yeah you know so I, I, mean, I remember the first time you told me that and I was floored I was shocked and I I can just imagine every just like every every instance in your life where you used to like all right maybe now's the time <laughs> <laughs> yeah yeah and the thing and, is like and, I fought it for so much have felt to finally oh do it oh my god oh my god like it was that feeling of this is like even though I knew at 15 that this was what I was meant to do I fought it for so many years I did I never told my parents my parents knew my parents and like my sister knew I was a fan of comedy because I'd go to comedy shows and rent uh you know rent dvds and vhs tapes of comedy but they never knew that i wanted to do it because i knew that wouldn't have gone over very well with my parents because my parents were very practical and it was like no you're, you, you know you go to, you're gonna go to school you get a degree you get a good job like you're not like how are you gonna survive like they wouldn't have understood you know what i mean and um i always thought it was something else like something else was missing you know so i tried to fill it with other things you know like Along the way, like I, you know, I learned to code and did all these cool things, but that wasn't what fueled me. And it was like that first moment I stepped on stage, green as fuck, like no idea what I'm doing, but just the the first, that very first moment I stepped on the stage, everything, I felt calm, mm. you know, just this peace. And it was like, oh, okay, I get it. I get it. I fought, I fought this for 
I fought it for nothing. Mm -hmm. You know, I fought it for nothing, but um, yeah, no, it's, uh, it's incredible. So I always tell people. Now you got people fighting for tickets. Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) I hear (laughs) pissing. (laughs) But um, yeah, so it's like, I always tell people, if you feel, if that, don't let anybody get in your way. Just, you know, like I wasted a bunch of, a bunch of time not like a year or two. I, it was 37 years from the time I said, I want to do this yeah. to when I actually did it. Wow. It was 37 years. Like, like it's, time you wow. accumulate experience. Yeah. <laughs> oh yeah. I got lots of experience, yeah, lots of life to draw on, but it's just like my father always used to, my late father used to always say everything in its own time, mm. meaning when you're ready, that's when things will happen sort yeah. of thing. So I, I tell myself that because Sure, it would have been cool if I was able to do it in my 20s or even my 30s or 40s. Um, but I can I know that it wouldn't have been. I don't think I'd have the the comedy comedy career. I use that you very loosely, but I wouldn't have the comedy career that I have now, I think, had I started in my 20s or my 30s, just because of what was going on in my life at the time. Mm-hmm. You know? Yeah. So as, yeah. as someone who did start doing comedy at 16 years old, I can tell you it's, it's just, it's, there's nothing of substance there. Just, <laughs> like, blueberries are weird, right? <laughs> That's another there's thing. Like I'm outside, green on the inside. Like, <laughs> oh, you have nothing to talk about. Meanwhile, so I'm, I'm like, like the existential you, crisis you, after my second divorce. <laughs> <laughs> like, you know, yeah. People want to hear about that. There's no substance there. Totally. Yeah. Because I have spoken to, like, I'm always, I'm always impressed and in awe of, like when people pursue their dream when they have it, like when they're young and do it. You know, I will, I will give young comedy this because I- Is that a rapper? (laughs) 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 Um, But I, like I've, I've spoken, like anyone I know my age that has done improv, like when they were a teen, we have a really hard time now being embarrassed because nothing <laughs> more embarrassing than what you did when you were first trying improv at 15 years old. Mm. Like it is, it is like, so like, I, I really don't feel bar- embarrassed very often because I can call back on like, like literally like rolling around on the floor in a scene that was not funny. Like, like <laughs> I, I remember like pretending like someone was like kicking like a dead baby inside me in an improv. <laughs> when I was like 15 and nobody was laughing and it was horrible but because I did that I know nothing else I do will be more embarrassing nothing you will know? scare you nothing will embarrass you nothing nothing scares me like I I did a, a stand-up set at the comedy desk recently and the audience was so flat they were oh. so dead they weren't laughing but I thought the like their unamusement was hilarious like I thought it was like really funny that nobody was laughing so I thought I was really funny like (laughs) very very few things can get Maggie down I will (laughs) I will say that that is that is something that I think um is 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 really wonderful and 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 drives her creativity a lot it's like well if it if it is bad is bad <laughs> yeah and that and that's the thing that I fu- it. like at least we're having fun and that's, exactly that's like and you're amazing. taking risks and yeah I think that's the thing with uh with uh with being younger it's like you're you're more fearless you know and you're more yeah. willing to take risks and 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 things like that as when you get older like you're thinking more of like consequences and and thing and, and things like mm-hmm. that like you're I think as you get older, you get a little more calculated. Yeah. You know, you, 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 you know, do more risk assessment versus Mm -hmm. let's just try it, you know? And like, and I'm like the opposite. I'm trying to be more like less risk averse, Mm -hmm. you know? Cause I, I know, like say it's probably the same with, with you, with uh, you both that if, if I'm preparing, like if I'm writing or preparing something and I go, should I say that? That's exactly what I should be saying. Mm-hmm. You know, that that feeling of like, should I? Is that too far? Is that too much? Yep. Like experience has shown me that, yeah, that's exactly 
what I should be saying. Even if it is too far, just try it. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. As as long as it's not like directly hurting anyone. Like I, I, because I feel like that's where that that's where like the little nuggets of genius come through. Yeah. And that's where, that's where it like really gets people is, is when you say something that is, you know, shocking or that like pushes their imaginations, that, that extra little bit that's when they're really affected by a joke where it gets, where, you know, people get like really like, "Mm, you can't say anything anymore is because (laughs) they think like, oh, should I say that? But it's like a slur. Yeah, (laughs) right, right. Or there's no point to what they're saying. Yeah, Yeah. they just, there's a disconnect there um, with comics, I think. Mm -hmm. Um, Because there has to be intention. I think every, with every performance, every, every movement, every word has to have intention. Yes. You know, and if you're just saying shitty things just to say shitty things, that's not edgy. That's not innovative. That's not provocative. That's just you being a dick. It's just a waste waste of time. Because, yeah, because if you look at, uh, say, any, any, like, like, world renowned, world famous comic who's, like, considered edgy, even though they could be saying some, like, shocking things or or um uncomfortable things there's they also have a point they're Mm -hmm. saying these things to get to a point yeah for you to be like ah or like whatever your reaction is like there's a point they're not just hurling these these uh ideas and thoughts out to harm people joke about anything yeah you get there are literally billions of things you could write a joke about and it's like oh wow I mean, oh, joke yeah. on binary people again. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, yeah. I had an experience <laughs> well, like that oh. um pretty recently when I was in Montreal. Like, I, I don't I don't know how much I should get into it, but basically I went to this open mic. Um and this man and like you know, anyone who is not like a straight white man in comedy has had a shitty experience in comedy you know what I mean like we can all relate to like hearing a really uncomfortable set or getting a weird comment or blah 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 but I went to this open mic and this man was doing the most heinous set I had ever heard in my life like there was none of the points were amounting to anything and they were just like it, it was it was just like basically hating on any group of like people he could like pick on and it made me livid and I called him out in the middle of his set. Like I yelled, no. Like he was like egging on the audience. He was like, yeah, yeah, don't you agree? Yeah. And I yelled, no. And he was like challenging me. He was like, what, like girl from Ottawa, like doesn't like my set and blah, 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 blah. Like he was being a real asshole about it. Um, and then he was like, imagine like yelling no during another comic set and the whole room laughed. And I was like in Montreal to try and meet other comedians. And I was like, well, this would be a good mic to go to. And then this man just did like a horribly racist, sexist, fatphobic, homophobic set. Mm-hmm. Um, and I was like, he had a checklist. He was like, okay, oh, yeah, that and then that. It like, was it was so cool. That's like, what so if gross. But I love racism. That was the joke. That was the joke. That was the joke. That's so stupid. Oh. I know. It's not like, even you know, funny. Like, we've all been in a situation where we're like, oh, should I say something? And like, how how many yeah. times it has to happen before you're like, <laughs> yeah, like you just yeah. have to say something. Oh yeah. my God, yeah. I, like, I didn't even realize it had come out of my mouth until it did. Because yeah. also like, I I have like a like a, a big strong part of my degree is women's and gender studies and like feminist studies and social activist studies like I could cite sources on why what he was saying was wrong like I remember calling Glennis as soon as I got out of the comedy club that I was like really distraught and Glennis is like well if anyone was gonna say something it's you fucking like feminist studies like <laughs> <laughs> and that's the thing we have we have to as uncomfortable as it is and sometimes you're like you feel like you're the only one there twisting in the wind um that yeah. that shit's got to be called out it, it does it, it yeah. has to be called out because like the yeah. fact that he keeps getting platformed is is what pisses me off mm-hmm. you know like you know he can believe what he believes and get that from whatever like i can't control what he does or doesn't know but the fact that he is saying it and people are still emboldening him to say it is like yeah. that's what's really fucked up you know and it's exactly. like if we end up getting like canceled in montreal for this incident 
and then, then I don't want to do comedy. Yeah, so yeah, exactly. So be it. So be it. No, yeah. Yeah, yeah cuz something like that happened uh this was I was still fairly new and um it was at an open mic here and the, this guy I haven't seen him since. So I I don't like I don't even remember his name or how entrenched in the community he was, but he basically went up there and and like every tired every tired stereotypical trope he used like low hanging fruit in my mm -hmm. in my opinion and it was uh like one of his jokes was was something along the line of like the little mermaid but it was before the whole controversy with the little mermaid being black like the new mermaid being black yeah. um it was like the whole like white like uh black disney princesses or something and like Ariel isn't black because black people can't swim sort of thing or some like something like that and I had been sitting there listening to like at this point like four minutes of his stupid lame jokes and it was like a reflex when he said that I was like some of us can swim you know <laughs> like we all no, no, you know, we can swim motherfucker <laughs> like you know like move it along sort of thing I was so incensed and usually like I don't do outbursts like that I'm not yeah. gonna, I'm not gonna heckle another comic you know but this was just I was just so tired because it was like you didn't even yeah. try oh so yeah, you didn't I even love, try I love that you said that because I think <laughs> I think somebody else may have been just like fuck you or something like that but you're just like you address the situation it's so you can swim like, <laughs> I can swim. Like, Come can swim. You know, yeah. like, what, what do you do with that? Because if you just yell like, you know, you suck or whatever, the guy can be just like, no, you suck. But yeah, exactly. like, we can swim. Yeah, exactly. Where can, yeah, where yeah, can what, he go? What is he yeah, saying to that? He, yeah, wait, wait, what's he going to say? No, you can't. Exactly. Yeah, for, he's yeah. like, prove it. Like, why? Prove it. Yeah, there's a pool. Let's let, let's get to the why right now. Yeah, <laughs> for real. Know? For real. Not a lot of people can understand like what the experience is like if you're not a straight white man in stand-up comedy yeah you know that people feel they could say whatever they want to you or or you know talk down to you like and yeah and then like I have an attitude if I'm like I don't need your help like <laughs> like yeah. no one asked you no one asked you <laughs> yeah. you know what I mean and if they're all like oh I was just trying to just get just get out of my face just yeah. If I need your help, I'll ask a lot. I'm not going to ask you, but I'll ask somebody else if I need help. Yeah, totally. You know what I mean? Totally. Yeah. yeah. I agree. Um, I find yeah. like a lot of straight white men that I've met doing comedy do comedy to almost like validate thoughts and opinions that they have. You know, like the like, oh, you can't say this anymore, and then get that re reaction to feel like emboldened in saying it. And then I feel like a lot of folks who are marginalized that do comedy do it as a way of like fucking coping. You know? Yes. 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 And 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 trying trying to do comedy to cope in a world that emboldens this comedy to like validate is so hard. It is yes. so hard to get your foot in that door because yes. often when you do, it's like it's like very tokenizing or it's like, oh, like here's the one black person on the lineup. Here's the one woman on the lineup. Here's the one lesbian on the lineup. Mm -hmm. You know, exactly. like I did a set at absolute months ago, months and months ago. Um, and in my set, I talk about being a lesbian. I say very expressly, I'm a lesbian. Um, and then I make like a joke about my boobs. And then later, it's very funny. Thank you. I love my boots. <laughs> and my kids are great. <laughs> but then the stable of men after the show started hitting on me and commenting on my boobs. And I'm like, what? Like, did you like, did you just see me, hear me say I was a lesbian, think it was hot? You know, think it was for you. Yeah, you know that's exactly what they thought. It was for you that you were like, "Hello, convert me." You know, yeah, like, for real, for real. And I'm like, "Oh my god, I'm a lesbian, but like for boys, like yeah, exactly, <laughs> just for the male gaze." You know, and take sure. me, I'm take me. Person, yeah, uh, <laughs> I'm a person for bald people. <laughs>
<laughs> I need a bald Christian man to come yeah. to my yeah, and save me. Exactly. exactly. Oh my god. <laughs> but it but it's incredible the the assumptions that are made if you're not a straight white man. Like I I was on a show, um, it was a, like a location show, like a, a not a satellite show. Yeah, it was a satellite show um where I went off somewhere. Um and I'd been to this town before, but I was at a different venue. And most times on the show, I'm the only woman, most of the time. I'm usually the only person of color, or black person in the lineup or in the room or in the county, sometimes <laughs> depending <laughs> on where I am. And uh, this particular night, like the microaggressions were just all over the place. Like oh. I'd never been hit with so many microaggressions in one night, like in one oh, sitting, yeah. that when I left, I was like, oh, yeah, yeah. you know, sort oh, of yeah. Thing. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Because yeah, yeah, yeah. when I got there, like I, I, I film, I record all my sets just because yeah, yeah, yeah. I, that's how I learn. That's how I, you know, uh, get rid of weird ticks and stuff like that. See if how very how something. By the way, <laughs> yeah, I have like, my very like first set. Yourself and watch it every time, which yeah. I've seen you do from like the very very beginning. Yeah, is like, for my very first set. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But like you know, it's it's <laughs> just such. It, I mean, it, it's what you need to do. Like yeah. so many people forego it because they just do the reps and that kind of thing. Yeah. Yeah. but um, it's helped me a lot no, like, it's you, helped me immensely the very very beginning every single time I've seen you do it and it's like so it's the commitment and the dedication to doing that is like it's really impressive oh thank you yeah. and yeah. it's 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 helpful like it really help it helps me so I get to this venue and you know I usually scope it out and then like I'll ask like the manager or whoever like, is it okay if I film? First of all, most times it's, yeah, it most times I haven't, I don't think I've ever had anybody say no. If, if it's, if it's no, it's usually like, there's no place to set it up. You know, it's like, I can't, I can't put it in this particular location, but I can usually find a spot. So I'd asked the, uh, the manager and he's like, yeah, you could set it up on the bar or whatever. So, um, just because I'm respectful of the audience. Like I set up the camera before the show. I let it run. So I'm not interrupting anybody or or anything, you know? And it's like, it's not that I, I want to record everybody else. It's like, I don't care about anybody else's set. It's just mm -hmm. mine <laughs> sort of thing. But if somebody set wants to- it. Yeah, exactly. Set it and forget it. I don't have to worry about like, oh my God, I forgot to set up my camera or whatever. So as I'm setting it up, I'm setting it up at a bar, at the bar. And this man comes and sits down next to me and he's watching the camera and he goes oh do you work for the restaurant and I'm like no setting it up oh oh do you work for the comedy club and I'm like not really I said I'm I'm one of the comedians and he's like oh <laughs> like he just saw a unicorn or something <laughs> <laughs> he's like oh you're one of the comedians I was like yeah and then I'm just like small talk I was like yeah I just I record my set so I'm just setting up my my uh my my camera and he's like oh that's so cool he's like obviously you're going up first right and I went excuse me he's like you're going up first obviously and I was like no no it's not obviously and no I'm not going up first because the thing is like in the, in the, like I was hired as an opener. So just by definition, I would have been going up first. Um, but that particular night, the, the middle was headlining in the city at the club in the city. So he went first just so that he could get back downtown and do his uh, headline set. So he went first. So the middle went first, then me as the opener and then the headliner and the host doing everything. So I was like, no, I said, it doesn't work that way. And he's like, oh, he's, he goes, oh, just because those guys are really good. And I'm like, oh, have you seen those guys? There's he's like, kicker. yeah, he's like, those guys are, he's like, obviously you're going first because those guys are really good. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, I'm really good too. And he's like, yeah, but you know, those guys, they're like, they're like pros. I'm like, have you seen them? Like, let me just say they're, those guys are all pros and they're great. 
Um, and I'm like, have you ever seen them perform? He's like, no, but you know, and I'm like, no, what? And he's like, yeah. He's just like, I just assumed that you were going first. I said, well, first of all, no, don't assume that I'm not going first. And I'm like, I'm performing with them because I'm good. I'm here tonight because I'm a good comic, you know? And then I just sort of shut him down and he was just sort of like, but uh, this is like, shut the fuck up, man. You yeah. know? So that was the first wow. microaggression. Wow. <laughs> yeah. So he just assumed yeah. that A, I worked for the restaurant, that I had yeah. to be working for somebody. Like I couldn't. Journey. It was a long journey. A exactly. Long I, journey. <laughs> also, yeah, I couldn't why, just be. Why did, he ask? why did why did he why did he need to know? Exactly. You know I mean? Exactly. He could have just he didn't have to say anything because I was there quietly setting up my camera, sort of thing. You want to make chit chat? Fine, I don't care. Yeah, he didn't have to talk to me, but he was just so like blown away that like oh wow a girl comedian and like. I couldn't possibly be funny. I couldn't, comic. a lady comic. I couldn't possibly be as good as these, these men that he's never seen, <laughs> you know, admittedly yeah. he's never, cause he's like, oh, those guys are really good. And I'm like, have you seen them? No, but you know, he's making the assumption that like, oh, because they're with the comedy club and they're men, they're, they're hilarious. Yeah, yeah. they are hilarious, you know, but Quite honestly, like I, I'm, I'm tired of having to educate people sometimes. You know, I'm really tired of of having to be the, uh, the, uh, you know, the having to teach people these things. Like it, it it's exhausting. For sure. Yeah, it's yeah, exhausting. It and, it should, and it shouldn't have to be your job. You know, like you, yeah. like, like when you're dealing with the system of oppression, like head on. It shouldn't also be your job to yes. tell people why it's wrong because it's so much emotional labor to just deal with it to begin with. You know, it's yes. even more to yes. tell somebody why it's an issue. Exactly, exactly. Because I've, thankfully, usually when I go to like small towns, it, it ends up being fun, but I'm always apprehensive because I'm like, I don't know where I'm walking into. I don't know what environment I'm going into. And I I haven't had anything um nothing terrible has happened to me like knock wood like shows have gone well and everything but there's something really interesting and I find it it just highlights how the world is not diverse enough that people people don't have diversity in their lives yeah. you know just with how they react to me sometimes you know like I was at a show um and I was the host. So they saw me the whole show, like throughout the whole show. And at the end of the show, um, I remember standing with the headliner in the in the middle, because we were just three. It was me as the host and then a middle act and then the headliner act. Um, the middle and headliner were two white men and, and me as the host. And the three of us are standing together because we were talking and everything. And people came up and talked to us. But let, if 10 people came and talked to us, seven never acknowledged me. It was like I wasn't even standing there. You and you're know? on stage the whole time. I was, yeah, it's not like, oh, I'm just some like, random person standing. I was on stage the whole night. Yeah. I was the first one they saw. And I was up there for like 15, 20 minutes at the start. And then between every set, I was there. I closed out the night. They saw me, but they came mm -hmm. up talked to them and didn't even acknowledge me that is so and that strange. happened that happens a lot so that happens up. a lot you know that happens a lot and, or it's like overcompensating where they're like all up in your face sort of thing <laughs> you know but more like, often than not having, it's like traveling for shows like you do and also being one of three on a lineup is a really big deal yeah, yeah. That's like huge. that is that is a really big deal for a stand-up comic. Like to to get hired for that gig and to and like get that much stage and time. And to get that mm -hmm. much stage time and 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 you know do that on the reg yeah. like you do. Yeah. Like but it's it's, <laughs> it's it's for a reason. Like you're you're a phenomenal comic. And it's it's so embarrassing that so many of these towns just don't have like yeah. some of these audiences just don't have the the respect to yeah, yeah. 
it's it's, it's like, even, incredible even if they prefer the other two's comedy you still gotta be just like hey thanks, thanks yeah yeah, for, yeah. You know? exactly because the thing is it's like i'm right there you're right you're there. Right, right there it's not like right. i'm somewhere else or whatever i'm right there yeah. it's yeah. like one two three and not even an not even an acknowledgement not even a nod or like a hey you were you were fun or nothing it's like I wasn't even there and wow. that happens a lot that happens a lot or when I go on stage usually it's usually if I'm hosting where people are just like you know and then I, I break the ice like if it it's I don't think people realize how difficult it is for uh like a non like someone who's not a straight white male to get mm -hmm. up in, on, on a stage where people are already going to just make assumptions like, oh, women aren't funny or, yeah. ah, you know, yeah. lesbian feminist. Ah. Like, you know what I mean? Yeah. Like, like yeah. The, I don't think people yeah, appreciate. Some aren't feminists. Yeah. And people keep talking about this. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but the fact that to get up on stage to perform in any capacity is, is difficult. You know, there's, you've got to have some sort of whatever to get up on stage and do that in front of people, but to try and get up, get up on stage and to make people laugh and to make people laugh who are like side-eyeing you, hmm. you know, you haven't opened your mouth, but they've already had, they've already sized you up already and have decided that hey, you're not going to be funny or whatever it is. Yeah. And then you have to work to break that down. Like, mm -hmm. I don't think that's appreciated yeah you know i don't think that's appreciated at all enough is that you know? so it's so much labor it's it's so much labor like i feel like i have had a really hard time like getting my foot in the regular like mic scene and club scene and like et cetera, et cetera. like just because i find that so exhausting like it is it's and like, I love comedy and I really like, I, I would really love to get more into that scene, like after, after like fringe festivals and like, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but like, that's why small fish has been so energizing because I know I don't have to do that emotional labor. I can yes. just sit up there and be funny. Like, I feel like in other instances, I have a lot of explaining to do and I don't mm -hmm. like feeling like I have explaining to do. Exactly. you know I feel yes. like I have to explain I'm a lesbian I have to explain that I'm like like Harry I have to ex explain that I'm like like you know you know yes. to like try yes. and make everybody more comfortable so that maybe if I make a joke about like macaroni and cheese they think it's funny you know yeah 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 no I I, I hear you I hear you because I feel I spend um I'm spending time being like things that bother me bother you too you know, mm -hmm. we're on the same wavelength. Like we have the same fears and hopes and dreams. I'm a person too, you know, yeah. chances yeah. are if this, if you find this funny, I'll find it funny too. Or if this bothers you, it might bother me too. And so I spend a lot of time, I find like highlighting parallels that it's like, I'm not some alien life form from another planet that you can't relate to. Like we have stuff we can relate to, you totally. know, and it's like, like we should be able to go up and just make a macaroni and cheese joke without somebody going, oh, they like macaroni and cheese too. You know what I mean? Right. You know what I mean? Right. Like you should be able to just go up and make your fucking macaroni and cheese joke. Right. God, thank you. <laughs> you know? Thank you. Without having to explain yourself or like, you know, yeah. make the it's make like the audience comfortable time. and stuff like that. You know, I feel like I, time, the more like the more shows that you do and the more, you know, elbows you brush and all that kind of thing and the more the more audiences that you know you can you can touch and that you can relate yes. to and that, and that really I don't, I don't know just really connect to the material that that yes. you have or really connect to the identity that that you put forth like that's those are like forever fans you know mm -hmm. So and I, I like I can't they, wait until they know you as somebody who they who they trust. Yes. And yes. like you build and you build that, you know, they say like you build your fan base like one by one. 
Um, mm -hmm. but it, it's so true. Like Maggie and I have definitely felt that, um, we have, we, you know, we have our returning customers, yes. um, which is, which is really wonderful because it, it feels so good to have somebody know your history like that and to yes. have somebody know what you can do. So you're not like proving yourself yes. over, and yes. over and over. Yes. Um, and, and we're so, we're so grateful to have those returning customers and, and to have those people who come back. Um, because it makes, it makes us feel like, oh, like you, you want some more? <laughs> okay. you might, well, you I, might. Have, I have to say like your show <laughs> was, and I've done a lot of shows and like, I've done hundreds of shows. Your show was the most fun I've ever had. Uh, doing stand -up. Oh, really? You know, I've done some, some incredible shows and yours was one of the best. Yours is one of the best produced. Oh. Yeah. And like in terms wow. of atmosphere and and feeling comfortable and having fun, hands down, that was the best. Because like you were saying before, like I didn't feel like I have to had to explain myself. Yeah. You know, oh, it's yeah. just I just got up there and and did my shit. You know what I mean? I just got mm. up there and said my jokes and I didn't have to. I didn't have to like explain myself or like give a little like see I'm relatable like jokes yeah that get just so that like I can't even explain it but like do jokes that people are like oh, okay like I think I I get her and then yeah. get into my stuff like I could just get into my stuff right away you know I didn't have to like soften them or like lube them up a little bit to, oh, people you were know. Really already like just really excited about what you had to say yeah and they yeah. love was... you they love you we were yeah me we, I... we didn't do much that much work at all yeah, <laughs> they loved you we were talking about your turtle joke for like <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that like, you went from like you've been trafficking that i hate turtles it was so funny i will never forget that it was awesome so they like you ate that up it was awesome <laughs> But I had, yeah, I had, I had one of the best times in comedy at your show. Oh, that's one that's really nice of you to say. Yeah, your show is, it was so much fun. It was I so have, much fun. I have a theory. I have a theory about why you say like the, the reception is really strong. Um, Cause you know, obviously, obviously people react um, differently to comedy. Like when I see something that is like really, really funny, um, I, I kind of have like a furrowed brow. I'm just like, wow, that is. <sighs> that's really funny like, <laughs> I'm, just like, I'm pissed off that I didn't think of it first just like oh, fuck, that is really funny. <laughs> I, just get, I get like pissy but I think um because the show uh is one that I, th I think we see a lot of people with their big with big friend groups you know there's like always like there's always like big tables of of friends like sitting together and it's like really dense space and i mean I, like the way that comedy clubs are constructed are, is very intentional you like you're supposed to be shoulder to shoulder yes, yes. so that because laughter's know, contagious like, and yeah me slapping next to you then yes. you feel like oh <laughs> 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 you don't want to seem like a drip and Karen. so i think like that coupled with the fact that everybody's kind of already amongst their peers and like they're and like you know they may have seen I like as as we grow I think it's really exciting because just like oh I saw you at the last small fish or like oh like yeah you know we were sitting next to each other remember like I'm you know and and, yes. and people are beginning to know each other yeah that the reception is like is only becoming warmer it's community it's, it's like, community like, yes yeah, yes it's, it's yes really special. we like I I was talking to someone recently and and they brought their their partner to small fish and it was the first time their partner had ever been in a queer space wow is that not the most special thing in the whole world like in the yeah. whole world oh, yes like, yes. like that's I, that makes me so happy that yes. like, like I think it's also like the warm reception is also like like that relief that you felt being on stage saying like I don't have to explain myself the audience feels the exact same relief yeah there yeah. isn't that fear of like oh is someone gonna make a joke that's gonna make me feel unsafe here mm -hmm. like exactly, like, exactly. I, I'm not gonna get grabbed like behind the waist because it's a, a tight bar you know what I mean just like the yeah. relief that everyone's in a space that's safe for them 
it just yes. uh, like yes. I feel it is I love I love comedy and performing but for me like that's that's my favorite part of of small fish yeah yeah it, it, I I love I loved I can't even express how much I loved it because it was the the variety like the variety show aspect of it the two of you with your skits in between that was oh my god when you took the jackets from the from people in the crowd like I, it was just so funny it was oh. so funny and and I just loved the whole like the inclusiveness of it like the diversity of of the of the performers and the diversity of of the audience because it's not very often that I'm in front of a diverse audience like for mm -hmm. a lot because <laughs> I, I remember being at a show and and uh the producer was like, oh, the audience was so diverse. And I remember thinking, I just saw white people. <laughs> it's all white people and one black girl in there. And he's like, oh, there were old people and young people. And I'm like, no, diversity isn't like blonde hair, brown hair, you know, <laughs> Irish and Greek. No, that's not diverse. Yeah. That's not diverse. <laughs> the thing is, one had red shoes, one had blue. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> Everybody and I works. just, I just, I just love that so much. I love that so much because I got exposed to, to uh, art forms that I, that I don't see very, I'd never seen burlesque live before. I'd never seen uh, what? drag. That was, your first that was my first, yeah, that was my first drag performance oh. in person. Like I, I knew what it was and I'd seen it on TV or in movies, but I'd never seen it live, you know, Whoa. and I, it was fascinating Whoa. and I'd never seen a drag performance live before. I've seen like drag kings and drag queens, but I'd never been like in a performance space. You know what I mean? And it was just, yeah. you know, like I I look forward to when a diverse show like yours is the norm. God, me Where too. that's not a special show. You know, where, where because the thing is, my my argument is always, you know, if the lineup is all straight white men, it's just a comedy show. Nobody, yeah. you know, but if, if, if the lineup is all women or the lineup is all people of color, it's a special show. You know, if the lineup is, is all LGBTQ plus, it's a, it's, it's a special show. Like, why can't it just be a show? I always think it's funny when it's like this show, woman edition. And it's, yeah, yeah, exactly. Exactly. <laughs> Pride edition or black yeah. history. Like I'm very popular in February. You yeah. know, because everyone's like, "Oh, you want to?" Hi you know. <laughs> yeah, totally. It like <laughs> this is activating my like my my academia brain because I studied <laughs> this in school, and it's and it's a process of making uh, whiteness, straightness, uh, like maleness, able-bodiedness, the norm by mm -hmm. by not giving it some extra name, by not labeling it. Like like those identities don't have to confront themselves. Mm -hmm. yes. They can exist comfortably unchallenged. Yes. And so by like by labeling everything else, I'll be like, oh, this is the queer comedy show. This is the woman comedy show. This is like the POC comedy mm -hmm. show. It's it's a process of normalizing like like privileged identities and othering other identities. Yes. Like it's it, like it's it's an evidence of like these interlocking mm -hmm. systems of oppression that like is so it's so prevalent in entertainment. Like it's ridiculous how prevalent it is. It yes, is. yes, 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 yes. I think yeah. one of the things I like I like most about um what small fish has has become is the is the branding for it and is the advertising for it because you know, I don't, I, we didn't go at it from a place of just like, Ottawa's only a comedy show. So, yes. You know, warning marginalized identities, like, you know, come see such in others. Such as <laughs> a Jewish woman. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, it's just our faces and the names. And if you mm -hmm. think, if you recognize those names, or if you know our faces and you know us to put out a good product, or you know one of those names to put out a good product, even if this show just looks mildly interesting, come. you can come check it out. Yeah. You know, it's it's it wasn't ever meant to alienate a certain group. It's mm -hmm. it's a non-swam lineup, which is the term that I've taken from my friend Katie Warren in, in Newfoundland. Who What's runs the term? A non-swam. Uh, uh, okay. There's no like non-straight white able male performers on the lineup. And this is that I took that from uh, Katie Warren, who runs New Funny in Newfoundland, which is very much the same um, 
format as our show. It's a variety show. It's incredibly produced. It's really wonderful. If you're ever in the East Coast, you should most certainly go check it out. I love you, Katie, so much. <laughs> um, and I, I was talking to them uh, about like, hey, is it okay with you if we like run like basically the same sort of show? And they were like, absolutely. Every city needs one or more yes. of yes. these shows happening in it. Yes, and, like for sure. you can do for it. Like they gave me like a ton of advice, which it was just like really, really wonderful. And and what I you know gleaned from Katie's process was that it, it's it's it was never about you know ex- excluding a group. It was never about making like this this tiny cage for us to for us to you know just be together in. It was just a it was just a celebration yeah yeah it was just, it was just a big party yes every time and I and I think that's that's so important to me that um that we're like that we're not making anybody feel like oh I don't belong here it's just like here are these wonderful people who are going to put on a wonderful show for you yeah, yeah. you know yeah and yeah. like that that's that's not to say we want to like trick anybody <laughs> into like oh, there's so bad here. <laughs> you know, like, look at all of us <laughs> but i think i think we definitely um have gotten more people at the at those shows by having kind of neutral advertising like that mm-hmm. and seeing like Oh, like this wasn't advertised to me as like like a like a woman show or like a woman of color show or, yes. or anything like that. It was just advertised to me as like a really cool, um, really cool event. Yes. And I yes. and I'm really happy I went and they'll come again. And like and I think that is that is growing our our diversity. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Meaning we have we have more white men, more of an older crowd coming in just because the show looks interesting. And they yeah, have, and that's you know, yeah. That that's how it should be. Like that people go to a show because either they know the reputation of the show or they know somebody who's performing on the show. Like if it piques your interest, you should go. Yeah. You know, totally. you should, yeah. Cause I, even though I like I understand why shows are are like labeled as like, you know, BIPOC show or or all women show or whatever, I understand that. Um, at the same time, sometimes labeling a show like that can people be like, oh, well, I, it's not for me. Yeah. I shouldn't go. It's only for women or it's only for BIPOC or it's only for, for, for the queer community. No, it's, it's, you can come. I I think that's in better words, but I was trying to to get that is that it it really is for everyone. Like there is something in there for everyone. For everybody. Yes. Yes. I think like I love when like all these different kinds of events can exist that kind of satisfy all of these needs. Like I love that small faces for everybody because if if you're there and you are marginalized in any way, it's cathartic. And if you're there and you're aren't, it's a learning experience, mm-hmm. you know? Yes. yes. And um, but I also love shows that are like like um I used to work at Camp Ten Oaks and they used to have something called centered spaces, which means like at lunch. Um, also, I should explain what Camp Janos is. It's a, it's a <laughs> summer camp for uh, like queer uh, children and the children of queer parents. And sometimes at lunch, they would have center spaces. So say it was like a, like a BIPOC center space. All BIPOC folks in the camp that wanted to participate would eat lunch together. And they had like a space separate from the rest of camp. And and the the goal was that like, this is an hour where you're definitely not going to get a microaggression and you get to just like sit and like feel at peace and, and talk to people who relate to you. Mm-hmm. So I love when event spaces can do that. Yes. When it's like, yes. if it's like, like a, like a, a woman comedy show that it's like, okay, like I know, I know who's like, there's a kind of relief in knowing who's going to be in the audience. But I also love when those other spaces exist that are like, this is for like everyone to come and like mm-hmm. rejoice in it. You know, like I think a marriage mm-hmm. is like, a little yeah. sprinkle of everything yeah. which i would love to do more centered space type things with small fish i think that would be so cool we're always mm-hmm. learning always learning oh we yeah learning because sure. I mean, we're we're only on our fourth show um and we we think each show has been you know more special than the last like we just we we are loving it more and more um and we and we want to make sure that 
as like as we grow like the format of small fish grows and that we are making it like the best that we can be yeah. um i mean like i know we have um our, our first show we had five acts on uh and uh and it was tremendous and they all knocked it straight out of the park and for show number four we have uh three acts going up uh for a longer time maggie and i also realized that like you know, we felt a little rushed on stage. So we want to like allot ourselves a little more time as well. We want to give the audience a little more time to go pee pee, you know, <laughs> because like, we're, we're adapting and we're changing with it. And uh, I, I think like, you know, if anybody comes up to us afterwards with like a, a piece of advice or, or a recommendation for how we can make that show, this show more accessible, um, mm -hmm. you know, we're open ears, both of us. Yeah. yeah. You know, because it's it's a wonderful thing that uh, that you're doing for sure, for sure. Because I know I felt super comfortable. I felt very very comfortable. You know, um, yeah. I can't even explain like all the reasons why, but I I knew it was. Uh, yeah, I, I knew. <laughs> I I just I knew it wasn't it 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 wasn't an experience that I've had before at a show where. I know I always, even as much as I love doing stand up and as much as I, I love, you know, like I, I do, um, uh, thrive off, you know, let's make these fuckers laugh sort of thing, like getting up on stage in front of a room full of strangers and making them laugh. There's also a little bit of apprehension too. You yeah. Know? And, you know, cause is somebody going to hurl some like racial or gendered or fat phobic or some something at me is somebody gonna hurl something at me or not pay attention to me because of of something like that and i i knew i didn't have that worry at your show and that's that's huge yeah, yeah. that's massive and also yeah. i'm like why is this not a consistent practice everywhere you know, like, why are, why are we the exception to the rule? Because like, yeah. I like, like, let us like, like, can tell you, like from the beginning, we were like, this is, this is going to be a, like a safer space for marginalized communities. Like this is, mm -hmm. it was no question in my mind. Why don't you explain, explain uh, safer space versus safe space? Oh yeah. Thank you. That was something. Oh, that true. I like. Yes. Yes. Um. So safer space is like, you can't ever guarantee that something will be a 100% safe space because like, like, you know, for example, like as a white person, I have internalized racism and I benefit from like, like um, white supremacist systems of oppression. And it's a constant process of unlearning these. And so I'm not immune from making microaggressions. And I find it's, it's a much more it's a better practice to recognize safer space because it's like, I'm going to do my best mm -hmm. rather than say like, I'm the most educated ever and I'm never going to make a mistake and blah, 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 blah. It's just yeah. like, like safer space is like committing yourself to an ongoing practice of, of making, making a space more accessible and safe right. space is kind of like claiming, claiming you've already achieved that even when like, there's always more we can do. It's all, exactly. There's always work for all of us all of us because we yeah. all to some to to a degree it's like i'll cut people some slack when it yeah. comes to things because it, it it's it i'll give you the benefit of the doubt that it's not coming from uh a place of ignorance or a place of of hate or anger you know to a degree <laughs> to a degree so sometimes yeah. it's deliberate and all of that but just the just in the same way that it's like oh i never thought of that before you know, I, ne I never thought of that. Someone could be in that same boat when dealing with me. So it's like, I try to have some grace and, uh, um, you know, some, some, uh, like flexibility is not the right word, but, you know, I try to, you know, give people an opportunity, uh, opportunity to, to do better, to learn and mm -hmm. to do better, you know, totally. but, uh, if you're not yeah. like consciously committing yourself to making your space more accessible for all different kinds of identities, then you're gonna perpetuate like a lot of fucking microaggressions. Yeah. yeah. And and often probably aggression aggressions, mm -hmm. you know? 
Like if, yeah, if yeah macro impression. Yeah, <laughs> ma micro and macro aggression. Yeah. Exactly. The full the full, the full gamut. Exactly. Yeah. It, it will happen. Like if you're if yeah, if if yeah. you don't do that work, that's mm -hmm. that's a consequence. hundred percent. For sure. For sure. The the, the the team at Irene's are wonderful. They're so, so good. They mm -hmm. have like they asked us tons of questions of like what, what we needed and you know, we we laid it out and they were they're just so I don't know they're just they're just so great yeah <laughs> I really I really can't, can't describe it it's just they're we wonderful. we we really couldn't ask for a better team over there or like a better better venue it is picture perfect yeah to, That's to the show that we that we want and to to have the environment that we want yeah it's, it's wonderful it's really special that's that, that's so good that's 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 amazing because <laughs> I, I yeah I just like I was, I remember riding high for a couple of days after the show because it was just so, uh, it was, it wasn't just uplifting. Like if I have a good set, I feel good for a couple of days, but it was more than that. Like I had a good set and it was just, the environment was just so beautiful and mm -hmm. welcoming and peaceful. And it just made everything so much, so much more enjoyable for me so i thank you as a performer a as a performer to producer like i thank you for that experience because that was uh that was incredible for me that that means the world that means oh. that means the world and then some like that like i i i said this i will keep saying this like small fish is like what makes me feel most alive in this world like this is mm. the most I think this is the most meaningful thing I've ever done. And I'm too, like, I, get, I get scared. I, I get scared sometimes because I'm like, oh, does like, does it, ma does this mean as much to Maggie as it does to me? <laughs> it's a big deal to Maggie. Just it's like, cause so I think about small fish all, all the time. time. <laughs> and so many so other many. responsibilities. Yeah. <laughs> no, but the thing is, it's I, like, I, it's, it's good. Like, That's I, good. Oh, you know, I cause the it. thing is when, you when you bring people together and they see that and they feel that they can't you one can't help but bring that out into the world after you've experienced that you know you're not going to leave that venue and go go back to meh, 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 meh. you know what i mean like you're going to bring that you're going to bring that out and i just like i wish more people i i yeah i i, I wish everybody could go to your show and experience that you know because i know the little team price of eight dollars <laughs> because i know the little like what i feel is like a fraction like if somebody because it's happened a few times and i love like i love it when people come up and say oh yeah you were funny and i enjoyed your set but when people come up to me and not just tell me i was funny but they're like when you said that thing about your hair thank you because i had no idea mm -hmm. i had no idea that that is and now I'm good now I, you know I'm gonna go into the world differently. That's yeah. incredible. Or if I have like somebody come up to me and say, I feel seen when you talked about XYZ or you know, whether it's about, you know, race or or weight or something where I where I've put it out there that somebody was like, I felt seen and yeah, I feel that way too. You know, and thank you for expressing it. You know, that that like what I feel with that I know is a has to be a fraction of what you of what you two feel um for that entire show so yes yes oh Simone I relate so hard like I it is really important to me that in the comedy that I write especially that it is it is more than the sum of its parts you know that this is this is my way of, yes. of coping with some with some interlocking system of mm -hmm. oppression some way of healing from it in a way that yes. either someone will learn or someone will also heal from mm -hmm. yes. like that is that is so important to me and and small fish feels like the event production version of that yes yes huh? absolutely absolutely where an individual performer because i i i write my material from like lived experience yes. you know things i've got like things i've experienced just navigating the world so I do that on the individual basis, but you do you you two do it on the collective, do that on a collective basis by bringing individuals, individuals with with different life experiences in as performers and also in 
they're invited in as spectators and participants mm -hmm. to the experience. Yeah. You know, and that's, uh, I, I think that's really special. That's really, really special. I think, it uh, yeah, so it, it feels really, really special. Maggie and I, I think, are are a better team than sometimes we give ourselves credit for. <laughs> um, yeah, I, right. I like we 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 pick each other up, um, and like we we balance each other out very well. Because I mean, you know, Maggie went to school, um, and you know, I worked at anthropology, so we both bring like really, <laughs> really good, uh, really, really <laughs> helpful <laughs> things to the oh, table. Wow. Um. <laughs> <laughs> no, like I, I, I love, like I love, I love working with somebody who actually can, can back up how passionate they are about a subject with, you know, the education that they've yeah. had. Um, it makes me feel that like we're really coming at this from the right place and from an educated place. Um, because I'm, I've always been like, you know, a razzle dazzle showman. <laughs> you know, I'm like, I'm a musical comic. You know, like I, I love the, I love the, the glitz and the glamour and. I love attention as well. <laughs> and so I think I'm I'm yeah, good at like getting the attention so people can listen to what Maggie has to say. <laughs> and oh, wow. and we realize that like we are such a good pair because like I like like my brain really works on like like I'm very my mom's always called me the absent-minded professor. Like I've always <laughs> been very like bookish. Like like <laughs> like what I said, I can back things up with research. But sometimes, like I don't always know how to like make it digestible. You know, okay. and Glennis is really good at, at not only making it digestible, but making it really like appetizing. You know what I mean? <laughs> like not only is that gonna feel really good in my stomach, but it's gonna be tasty. Like, yeah, it's a tasty. Maggie, <laughs> Maggie's like the steak, and I'm salt bay. You know? <laughs> yeah, you're. <laughs> Like, that is really good at making things like very like beautiful and very Aww. very like um oh like like very magnetizing you Aww. know oh, nice. that's true that's really nice it's true <laughs> like Venice wrote like our opening and our closing song for small fish and I feel like having an opening and a closing number is such a like like I remember one of our pals Madeline the first show she was mm. like when you guys started singing that number everyone went oh shit we're at a show we yeah are yeah yeah going on uh, yeah you know, when and when we had our our pre-production meeting you're like here's the song for the final number i was like what you mean? i was like number. final number you mean oh, i don't just God. do my thing I and i was like <laughs> and i was terrified i was terrified uh, yeah, you did so good you it was such so a great fun. job i love i love the closing number it was so much fun. <laughs> because i love the muppet show i love the carol burnett show yes. and like every yes every and all those shows all those variety shows had yeah. an opening number and a closing number yeah yeah, yeah and like a closing really number with the whole set yeah really yeah like ta-da like we have we have put thought into this like like you can really tell that this yes. is this is that we that we slaved over so. yes because it wasn't just uh like, thank you for coming that's the end of our show and then it like it just wrapped it all up in a in like a perfect like this was he here <laughs> yeah ta-da we're done yeah. Bye -bye. Yes. Yeah. thank you uh, ta-da <laughs> i still think we should do a conga line out of the, out of the <laughs> people have got people got to pay that's kind of awesome. <laughs> i would love that but yeah, yeah no, I, really I've said it in creative partnerships. There's like, if you imagine a hot air balloon, there's a balloon and there's a basket. And without the basket, the balloon flies and burns up in the atmosphere. And, and without the balloon, the basket never gets off the ground. Mm, right. And I feel like I'm a really good basket to Venice's balloon. Aww. Aww. Oh, that's a beautiful metaphor. <laughs> that's, yeah, that it's like, yeah, you're, mm -hmm. no, yeah. that's. That's also, awesome. Maggie also fills me with hot air a lot of with the time. Hot air like this. Like... <laughs> <laughs> no, but uh, no, congratulations on on creating this, and uh, it's 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 an amazing amazing project. Like it's really not project, but the production is is fantastic. It's fantastic. Oh, and nice. One we, of the one of the best see, times I've ever had. Yeah. Well, I really, 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 really appreciate that. Because we also like we both admire you so much as a comic. Yeah. Like you were oh, thank you. <laughs> your name is in 
like my little like comedy notebook somewhere like right after we had the meeting with our reigns where they confirmed we could do the show we were like brainstorming who we wanted on the show and you're like you're you're like yeah, you're like there like i remember <laughs> like, sitting in Petalman's writing your name and yeah. my fluorescent blue pen oh thank <laughs> you you're eating bagels like we want some <laughs> and I remember so we're gonna we're gonna uh wrap this up but would you like to play a game i just call crazy questions yeah yeah okay so So, um the way it works is i have 249 questions i used to have 250 but i deleted one and i haven't replaced it so you could pick a number you written all of these pardon me you written all of these i scoured them from the internet wow yeah so i like i I, yeah i scoured them from the internet so they range from like serious to silly to in you know everything in between so um, yeah yeah, so i have i have one to 249 so i'll ask you to pick a number and i'll read the corresponding the, the corresponding question okay amazing okay so pick a number please let's confer yes <laughs> One hundred seventy-four. One hundred seventy-four. What is your least favorite word? Ooh, that's a perfect question for Glennis Marshall. Oh, that is a perfect, perfect <laughs> question. <laughs> 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 really, Glennis, last night at Meow That's Hot gave such a wonderful answer about like like her passion for like linguistics and how like words fit together and hold hands and like. <laughs> This is a Glennis Marshall question. Oh, but like I just I this would have been such an easy question. We're just like, what's your favorite word? I've been like, <laughs> um, oh my gosh, my least favorite word. I mean, I know a lot of people usually say like moist uh is is their least favorite word, but I I, th- I think that's quite old hat. Um oh my gosh. Oh, I have mine. Yeah, go when people instead of saying bathroom they say potty yeah <laughs> I, I don't like that either <laughs> for me, for me. <laughs> yeah, i don't like that either mine is the hives. <laughs> yeah yeah uh, yeah i don't like that one mine yeah. is one of mine is panties mm. panties yeah yeah ick 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 the yeah. ick factor is 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 strong I with that one i don't love yolk like egg yolk? Yeah. No reason. <laughs> Is there an alternative? <laughs> you know, I, I don't mind yolk like a suspender yolk or like the yolk of a shirt. But like, what Y O K E? Oh, but when but when it's with Y O L K? Yeah. Gives you problems like that. Yeah, it does kind of sound sick. Yolk. Sounds a little sick. <laughs> sounds, it, it just sounds like you're a little sick yeah not the good sick right yeah. not sick like sick yeah <laughs> like, alternative sick. alternative answer is my name in french what that is, is it in French? alternative answer is my least favorite word um because i have a joke about this that it sounds like a like a boulder being dropped in a body of water because they really pronounce the gl it's like glenn <laughs> 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 um so i hate i hate that word for sure, <laughs> sure. <laughs> that one sucks oh my that, God. yoking your name in yoke, french yoking. Potty. Yoke and potty and panties okay <laughs> what a good little collection of words yeah awesome. <laughs> all right please pick another one another number okay let's say let's say one number on on three one two three sixty nine <laughs> 69 and four okay let's we'll do 69 first what's the closest you've ever come to being arrested oh once okay when i was in first year um so the fire alarm used to go off in our residence buildings all the time all the time because you know it's like first year people like fucking vape in the bathroom and they're stupid about it um and you had to leave you were obligated if you were in the residence building, you had to evacuate. And if they like caught you like hiding out, then you were in serious trouble and you mm-hmm. could really be fined. I don't know about arrested, but like at the very least, you were you you broke some law in like some yeah. capacity. 
I remember once um, feeling particularly bold one day because the fire alarm all went off all the time that I just decided not to go down one time. <laughs> And me and my roommate, we were in the same boat and we were like, let's go see who's outside. And so we walked to university. Let's see there who's there first. Like, like, oh shit, the fire marshal totally just saw us. And then we like duck and like ran back <laughs> to the room. So that's probably, that's probably the closest wow. I'd ever been. And it was, that was, see, absent-minded professor. That's, that's <laughs> what I mean. I like do shit like that and like not think about it. I've, I've never that's... been very close to being arrested. I think I, I was almost kicked out of residence for my hot plate. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> and I was like, at the time I was like throwing up sick. Like I had a cold so bad that I was like in bed, like nearly, nearly just like not asleep, just unconscious, just because oh, no. I had just my guts out. Like I had like the worst flu, and I had locked me up, <laughs> made myself a little pot of soup <laughs> on my heart. <laughs> that it was supposed to be me. And, and my and the the head of residence, the the what are they called? The RA. The RA um he came in he kind of said just like hey I, I heard you like <laughs> tried to burn the residence down with that rolled hot like, plate <laughs> I'm like, eh, like, eh. like yeah it was fine and then he then he kind of like just like yeah okay he does like a scan of the room he's like you have to come with me <laughs> I do <laughs> right <laughs> now like Randy, <laughs> do I really have to go? And he was like, yeah. I was like, I, I really made a meal of it. Like I took my duvet with me. I was like, justice. Yeah, I guess that was the, that's I, the I was in big trouble. <laughs> For a hot plate while you're sick. Yeah, For a hot was... plate while you're sick. Oh my God. <laughs> All right, what's oh, question four, Ms. Simone? Oh, question four, yes, question four. What movie can you watch over and over without getting tired of? Spirit Stallion of the Cimarron. That was so quick. Love that movie. Damn. Even though Matt Damon voices him. <laughs> sucks. Oh, is that the one with the horse? Yeah. Even though Brian Adams does the soundtrack, which sucks. Um, <laughs> you're really selling this one. Great film. It's aged. I think pretty good. Yeah. Considering it's content, I think uh, yeah. And I there's this there's this line at the end of the movie where um uh our our one of our protagonists is saying goodbye to his horse. <laughs> he puts a feather in her hair and he says, "You'll always be in my heart." And I used to say that to everyone. <laughs> <laughs> For saying goodbye I was just like bye you'll always be in my heart <laughs> <laughs> yeah Aww. I love that I love that movie um oh I don't know eight I'm crazy not... nights <laughs> say eight crazy nights. have you seen eight crazy nights uh, no I've heard of it but I've never seen it it is it is an Adam Sandler as Adam Sandler <laughs> yeah it's like four different characters. Yeah. It's a musical. Animated. And it's animated. Like Disney animated. Oh, Not wow. Animated, okay. Like Disney adjacent animated. Yeah. And it's it's like so horrible you can't look away. No. <laughs> and I watch it every year uh, around the holidays. Um, <laughs> it's about like celebrating like Christmas and, and Hanukkah. And I like, yeah, it's like, <laughs> it's like nuts. Actually, our, our, um, our group chat name with with our other pals is called technical fouls because there's a song and there oh there's also a running theme of basketball basketball is <laughs> really important in the movie and because adam sandler loves basketball <laughs> he was like we gotta have lots of basketball. we gotta have basketball in this thing and like i can i can quote it i can sing most of the songs yeah. like i've i've seen this movie more times than i can count so maybe it's a, <laughs> it's a horrible answer but i also love showing it to people for the first time because they're like the fuck is this this is your childhood christmas movie <laughs> this 
this was it. It's awful. It's awful. But it's like you gotta you, you gotta experience it. If oh you my. touch the thermostat, you'll get hit with a bat. <laughs> <laughs> the I also memorized the movie when Maggie showed it to me, and I yeah. I can I can watch it. Also. You can reset. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, so that'll be my answer for now. I'm in that super Eight crazy day. Okay. <laughs> okay, let's do one more. All right. Hit us with that 89. 89? Okay, let me find it. If you could have a magical power, what power would you choose? Mm. I know the answer to this because I think about this all the time. It would <laughs> be recover things that I had lost. Oh, so really? if I'm like, not from you're like losing your phone, but like if you've lost an earring, if you've lost your presto card, if you've lost like something really sentimental that meant a lot to you, if you have lost like a, like a book that you read a lot in your childhood, like it, ex it extends just like things that you used to own that you don't know where they are. And you just like see in your mind, like where they are. <laughs> Did you do it with people? Did you find people with it too? possibly well yeah i think i think i'm more more equated to objects um and just like okay. ha either having them in my hand which wouldn't we be more convenient but i always pictured it as like an intense light glowing um from where that object was that i could see oh, wow which is like a lot more inconvenient <laughs> i realize but that i just my fantasies are just very theatrical <laughs> <laughs> there's beacons in the sky where my ear yeah, there's where a, my earring back there's is. There's a bat signal shaped like an earring. Back. Like an earring in the sky. <laughs> there it is. Like, yeah, my um, earring. Like, yes, and I have to go to the Rito Center where I could have just summoned it, but you know, exactly. lucky adventure, I guess. But that would be mine. It absolutely Whoa. need to recover things that I had lost. Wow. Okay. okay, mine always used to be uh, that I could grant wishes because then I could have any power that I wanted you know oh. and, but I know but now and that was always you're my like power. that kid who says their favorite color is rainbow yeah <laughs> oh, it is. And, I, and I'm realizing now I really don't like that answer but I don't <laughs> but I don't know because then it's not special you know like it's not like like if I can have any power that I want then it's not special you know I'd rather mm -hmm. have like one one special little power mm -hmm. so I think smaller. Mm. <laughs> no, <we even>, oh. <laughs> Downside. Uh, Here's Simone, you go first. I'll, I'll, I'll ponder more. Noodle it. Okay, for me, it would be either to read minds or be invisible. Mm. Like invisibility, you know? Mm. Yeah. One, one, yeah, one, one, one of those two. Yeah. yeah. I, think, I think being invisible has less... Um, bite you in the ass factor yes because at the same time reading, i think you made no information you didn't want you do, to i did yeah that's the th that's the thing that's the risk of it it's like i might you know read something that i really didn't need to read or didn't want to read yeah. you know um but invisible yeah invisible to just like slip in places and you know yeah. i might see and see and hear things i don't want to see or hear either but, you know. yeah yeah <laughs> no you're so right i i think if you if you choose invisibility i i think you might as well throw in like being able to like pass through walls like a ghostly ability yes yes like yeah exactly going through walls i don't need to i don't need doorways anymore just yeah. like sneak into like concerts and 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 like planes and yeah stuff. Yeah, you know. yeah. I just watched the Dungeons and Dragons movie like seven times in a row, and I just stay in the theater <laughs> overnight. Imagine how many places you can stay in overnight. Yeah, just find empty rooms. Oh, exactly, oh. find an empty room and then just you know. That'd be amazing. that'd be epic. Okay, I think, I think mine um, would be uh, talking to animals. Oh and yes, I yes. Love animals, and if I could yes. have like conversations with animals, and like that would be really, that would be really. Yes, special. yes. So that's a fitting power for you. I think. Yeah, yeah. yeah that's a, that's a nice one. That's a nice one. Well, thank you both so much for for taking the time to talk to me. I appreciate I appreciate your talent. I love you both so much, and thank you for 
for for being you and being in the world and bringing uh, small fish to the masses. Oh, thank you so much. <laughs> this has been such a like an energy giving conversation. Yeah. Like it feels like I feel like like you know like we all got each other's backs, you know. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. Like and, and that's so. Isn't that like like just like a warm hug? Yeah. You know. Yes. Yes. Warm. Yeah, yes. totally. Yes. Every cockle is like mm. <laughs> is warmed. <laughs> totally. Ooh, totally. yeah. Ooh, like yeah. That, like, <laughs> yeah. Ooh, the operator. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> My cockles are singing. <laughs> yeah, my cockles are very happy right I, now. What are you doing? <laughs> yeah, totally. yeah, thank you so much for for like inviting us on your on your show. This is yeah, so. Thank lovely. you for it's thank really you nice. for being here. Thank you for being here, and I'd love to have you back. You have a standing invitation. Oh, thank to you. This show all Actually, the time. It, in these last couple of minutes, we should mention um, Glass and I are both in the Ottawa Fringe Festival mm-hmm. coming. Oh, up. nice, nice, nice. When yeah. when is the uh, what are the dates for the festival? It's June fifteenth to twenty fifth, and I believe all the venues are like in and around Arts Court. Um, and yeah, it's so much fun. There's like probably like fifty plus plays that wow. are all coming, mm-hmm. and I'm writing one with uh, my partner Megan. It's like a comedy, um, like a series of vignettes about like experiences we've had together, like being a queer couple. Um, and it's so much fun and it's called always because the adventures of maggie and megan and oh, nice. it's really really wonderful yeah. that's amazing congratulations um, we met each other because i i saw it at the fresh meat festival and i was like you <laughs> and it's like you me business <laughs> i wanted to work with maggie immediately oh that's awesome and my that's show amazing. is called nui and it is a uh dance theater um kind of sketch collective uh, uh, surrounding the theme of uh, partying and nightlife. Uh, and uh, it's me and uh, three other wonderful uh, creators, um, as well as our, our director and stage manager. Um, and we had put it first up at the Youth Infringement Festival and we were continuing the work. Uh, and it's it's really, it's really fun. There's lots of amazing music and dance. Um, there's laughter, there's tears, there's... <laughs> You'll laugh, you'll cry. <laughs> yeah, it's excellent. I saw it on a on a grainy Zoom casting. Yeah, because I had COVID at the time, but I still really wanted to see it, and it was it was phenomenal. Also, is in it? Yes. Oh, nice. Yes. Your yeah, your your first burlesque experience. Yes. Yes. Or I'll say yes. Betty Bay watches it. Betty Bay watch. Betty Bay watch. Yes. 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 And uh, and the next small fish is May thirty first, eight p.m. at Irene's. Uh, we've got some improv, some stand up, uh, some more, some more burlesque uh, for this one. Uh, Maggie and I are going to be up to our usual tomfoolery. Um, maybe some clown. Who knows? Who knows? Who knows? <laughs> we do. Yeah. We yeah. do. We know. <laughs> you know, uh, you know. But it's going to be such a wonderful time. So please, uh, please come out to that if, uh, if, if you're watching this. Yeah. Oh, that's amazing. That's amazing. So thank you again, and. Uh, I'll have uh, I'll have the small fish social media info as well as Maggie and Glennis's uh, personal uh, social media uh, handles in the show notes. And thank you for tuning in and we'll see you next time. Bye. 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 Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.